Welcome to EPG Partshala. We are going to discuss a module called Self and Salvation. This module is written by Ajay Kumar Varma from Jawaharlal Nehru University, Delhi. I am Raghuram Raju from University of Hyderabad. The title of this module is Self and Salvation. One of the major convergences that you find across religions is their concern for salvation. There are religions who differ about what is the origin of the universe? How did this world come into existence? However, they all converge on the purpose of this universe. And the purpose of this universe is closely related to the salvation of individuals and in some cases, salvation of the entire humanity. So that's the most important theme or convergent platforms in religions across the world. So the reason why we look for salvation lies in several aspects. One of the important governing principle that drives us into to, to seek for salvation is to have a better life than what we already have. That is, when we look for salvation, when we look for salvation, we already assumed that what we are now has certain limitations. At least it is a, a lower state and then we should strive for a better state of human existence than what we are presently in. The other way of looking at the reason for salvation is that we lack something. We lack something. Since we lack something, we look for more that is, there is something incomplete in our existence and that we strive to make it complete. That's the important drive that makes human beings to seek salvation. So religions project different ways of looking for salvation. And that is the important point that we are going to discuss in this module. So the idea of salvation or the nature of salvation largely depends upon the metaphysical beliefs of that religion. Now the another important reason for salvation is that we look for freedom from our present existence. And there are certain feelings of strain in our present existence that make us to look for salvation. There are other others who also try to find out what are the causes for the limitations that surround our present existence and how does one overcome this predicament and then reach salvation. So this is the most important thing that we have to look for. Now, one way of making a better understanding of our limitation is to find out what is the nature of the world? Is the world perfect and human beings not perfect? Will then this will be known when we know what is the world and whether how we know the world correctly or not. All these things govern our aspirations 
for salvation. Thus, a soteriological view of any system of thought is inexplicably intertwined with the ontological and epistemological presuppositions of that system. These metaphysical presuppositions offer widely from one religion to another so much that to group them under one head will be very very difficult. It will be philosophically challenging task. Notwithstanding this, anthropologists point out that some of the most primitive religions view human freedom or salvation as emergence from their immediate needs such as food, health and things like that. So this is the, another contrasting explanation about how, why human being seeks salvation. However, there are those religions that admonish salvation through individual effort, mostly by acquiring knowledge and following strict ascetic discipline. Buddhism, Hinduism, Jainism and Sikhism would probably fall under this latter category. Certain other religions, apart from their emphasis on knowledge and faith, also emphasize the sum of the total life choices we make and the cumulative drift that we are subsequently put into at the time of that as the most crucial factor in deciding our fate at the time of final judgment before God. Apart from individual self-effort, these religions also emphasize the grace of God and usually expose a belief in the divine savior who spiritually helps human beings to emerge from their moral fallibility. Christianity, Judaism and Islam could be broadly put into this category. Keeping in mind this broad categorization of different religions in the world, in this module we will present a synoptic study of the soteriological views of the different religions in the context of their views regarding the self and the world. Now let us begin with Christianity. If you look at the idea of the self and salvation in Christianity, we find that both these ideas derive their meaning through their relationship with the idea of the fall of humanity in Christianity. This is the very important point or event within Christianity. Further, the idea of fall of humanity is hinged upon the idea of the original sin. The existence of Adam and Eve originally in the garden of paradise signifies human existence in sync with the divine existence. It is held that Adam and Eve committed the original sin by defying God's command when they ate the forbidden fruit tempted by Satan. This led to the spiritual and moral fall of all humanities. The sin has been inherited by all descendants of Adam and Eve, which includes the entire human population. Humanity, therefore, is characterized in Christianity as already in a state of spiritual fall. Humanity deserves to be damned by God because we are descendants of Adam and Eve who committed the original sin. Apart from this punishment earned for individual sins that human beings commit, in their actual lives out of our own free will. So Christ is supposed to be the source of human salvation because he offered his own life as the price for the atonement of the sins of humanity. If we wish to understand the same story through the binary opposition of good and evil, then eating of the forbidden fruit could be the, as the work of the devil, devil's design upon human beings and Christ's crucifixion could be viewed as sacrifice offered to God as atonement for giving into that temptation. Viewed from this way, Christ's death 
could be viewed as a sacrifice to salvage humanity from the clutches of the design of the evil that takes the form of various temptations. Belief in the saving power of Christ is fundamental to Christianity. Christ is a savior who has already made the supreme sacrifice through his death as propitiation for the original sin. A life conducive to human liberation therefore envisages as one where we live in the constant memory of Christ's supreme sacrifice and a life of atonement. Striving to stay away from all the possible deviations constituted by the temptations designed by the devil to lead us into the trap again which led to the original sin in the first place. So that's the you know the source of liberation in Christianity. So that's a very important thing and Christ plays a very important role in leading humanity from the state of sin and fall to the liberation. Now let us look at the idea of salvation in Judaism which is another oldest religions that we have. Judaism has a unique place among the world religions insofar as it has a conception of collective redemption as opposed to individual redemption. That is the most important aspect of Judaism. Judaism views the present state of humanity as a state of exile. So the entire humanity is in the state of exile. The core belief of Judaism are based on its view of Israel as a state of select people and their king, Yahuwah, who is supposed to be the leader of the heavenly army against the enemies of Israel according to the covenants between him and the people of Israel. Believers of Judaism consider him as the God of Israel. The salvation of the individual Jew in Judaism can only be understood as part of salvation of the entire people of Israel. The notion of collective salvation is directly supported by the teachings of their holy text Torah. Though the emphasis about the collective liberation, the holy text of Judaism, however, argues for moral sanctifications of the individual but at the same time exhorts believers to work diligently together for their spiritual well-being and assist each other in this pursuit in such a way that it could ultimately result in the restoration of Israel. The restoration of Israel could be taken to mean all senses of the term. It is spiritual restoration as well as restoration of the lost ethnic state also called as the holy land or the holy nation. Restoration of this land has been described as the establishment of a new temple of the Lord which could be in this world or could also be considered as a vision of some new cosmic order. This land is imagined as a place where humankind after repentance and sanctification will come together for the ultimate redemption of humankind. So having looked at both Christianity and Judaism, let us look at another important religion called Islam. Islam also believes that humankind is essentially wayward and sinful, but it does not believe in the idea of the original sin that Christianity holds so central to its beliefs. According to Islam, humankind is born in a state of purity and is naturally inclined towards morally rightful acts which include worshipping and praying to God. However, human beings are also endowed with free will and are thus capable of making mistakes and committing sins. However, unlike Christianity, Islam does not hold the whole of humanity is responsible for carrying on the burden of the original sin of Adam and Eve. In an Islamic view, each person is responsible for his or her own actions. A 
according to Islam, salvation is viewed in terms of an act of favor of God in the wake of the fact that humankind is imperfect and is in need of God's guidance, forgiveness and love. Accordingly, Islam exhorts its adherents to be constantly mindful of the forgiving nature of God and pray to him for the same. Notwithstanding this, according to Islam, on the final day of judgment, only those who believe in the all-loving, forgiving nature of God and pray to him would get an entry into heaven, while all others who sinned without praying to him for repentance will be doomed. Accordingly, Islam considers Muhammad as the greatest of the prophets, who, whom the all-loving and all-merciful God sent to admonish the people of this impending fate if they do not put their faith in him. Thus, salvation is conceptualized in Islam mainly in the sense of escaping future punishment on the day of judgment if one does not believe in the teachings of God as laid down in the Holy Quran. Unflinching submission to God and his teachings in the Quran is viewed in Islam as the only means to salvation. Actually, faith in the judgment of God and complete and wholesome submission to his will are at the core of the Islamic view of salvation, so much so that the appellation Islam itself literally means submission. Now let us look at at another important religion, namely Zoroastrianism. The main feature of Zoroastrianism as a religion is that it views the universe as the arena of a constant battle between two ethical principles for control over the universe. These two moral forces are considered to be personified as Ormazd and Ahriman. Zoroaster, the founder of this religion, is revered as a guru or a spiritual guide who helps his followers in the choice of right. This is supposed to assume his followers that they would gain eternal salvation hereafter. Zoroaster exhorts his people to observe purity of body and soul as the means to attain salvation as revealed to him by his or Mazat, who is the god or personification of good. Another interesting tenet of Zoroastrianism is its belief in the freedom of the will and its juxtaposition with the responsibility of human beings to their creator. This lies at the core of the moral and ethical systems of the Zoroastrian religion. According to Zoroastrianism, the battle between Ormazad and Ahriman would ultimately result in victory of the former over the later. Soyashians, who is an agent of Ormanad, would resurrect the dead for the day of judgment. On that day, all those who observed the precepts advocated by Zoroastrianism would be rewarded in heaven and all others would be sent to hell. But this is envisaged as only a temporary predicament since Zoroastrianism as an optimistic religion envisages salvation for all irrespective of their deeds in the past. Zoroastrianism believes in the prophecy that an impact of earth with a heavenly body would cause a flood of fire and molten rocks. This fire would purge the sins of everybody irrespective of their deeds except that those who had done more evil deeds in the past would suffer more in this fire and those who had sided with the good would be immune to its heat. After this baptism with fire, all human beings, irrespective of their deeds in the past, would become immortal and purged of their past sins. This is envisaged as a state of collective salvation in Zoroastrianism. Salvation in Zoroastrianism thus takes the form of deliverance from suffering after death and ultimate collective salvation is assured to all after they go through the degrees of suffering in proportion to the extent of purity or sinfulness in their lives on earth. Before we discuss the next religion, namely Hinduism, let me point out to you that 
there are several branches of Hinduism and they, that variety is very broad. So it is very difficult to put all of them together. However, there can be some convergences that can be enumerated and they are as follows. One, the soul or self, Atman, is subject to samsara, that is, transmigration through many forms of incarnations. Two, the soul carries with it the burden of its past actions, karmas, which condition the form of its future incarnations in the form of what is termed as karma. Three, as long as the soul mistakes this phenomenon world for reality and clings to the existence in it, it is doomed to suffer endless births and deaths. Nonetheless, one of the holy books of the Hindus, namely the Bhagavad Gita, enumerates three main ways towards the path to salvation or moksha. These are Jnana Marga. Jnana Marga is conceptualized as liberation through right knowledge. Right knowledge here mainly means the realization of the individual self with the universal self called Brahman. The term Jnana here does not mean knowledge in its ordinary sense. Jnana instead refers to a special kind of knowledge, knowing which is transitive. Ordinarily, when we talk about knowing, it necessarily refers to some object known. The term Jnana in its special sense means a particular state of mind attained after a deep contemplation over the real nature of the world. Thus the term Jnana has been used in the sense of self-referential intransient state of mind where the distinction between the knower and the known disappears completely. The second marga for salvation is Karma Marga. Karma Marga is generally supposed to refer to one's fulfilling of ritual and social obligations out of the pure sense of duty without letting one's personal inclination interfere with it. Duty here means obligation associated with the particular varna that one may belong to by virtue of birth. The duty of a Brahmin is to dispense knowledge to the common masses. The duty of a Kshatriya is supposed to be ruling over the masses and fighting for the sake of his subjects. The duty of a Vaishya is to earn worth and that of Sudra is to serve all the Varnas, especially in their menial tasks. The third one is Bhakti Marga. Bhakti Marga refers to the path of devotion for a personal deity. Most of the devotional moments are associated with one or the other of the Hindu gods, either it is Vishnu or Shiva. According to Bhakti Marga, intense personal devotion to the personal deity finally results in the grace of God or his divine intervention which leads one to salvation or moksha. It would not be out of place to point out here that in the 17th century, a host of saints, including Kabir, Raidas, Ravidas, etc., wrote poems and songs in praise of the Lord and composed poems pointing out the futility of rituals and scholarship of Vedas in matters of salvation. Instead, they believed that salvation is a matter of love and devotion towards God and anybody irrespective of their caste and creed, could achieve salvation through the grace of God by invoking it through the love and devotion to the Supreme God. So there are these three paths to salvation, which are major uh, um, uh, aspects of uh, Hinduism. Now, there is, a, uh, th th there is a discussion about whether all these three paths are equally important or 
there are some who will argue that one is greater than the other but there are third kind of people who will say that each caters to certain kinds of people bhakti marga is good for some people jnana marga is good for some people karma marga is good for some other people so the discussion goes on so what is important to recollect here is that there are very important notions of salvation in hinduism and they also lay down specific paths to reach the salvation to attain moksha having discussed hinduism let us look at another important religion namely buddhism before we begin our discussion on the buddhist notion of nirvana or salvation let us look at their views of bondage in the first place that's very very important the buddhist view of liberation begins with the realization of the fact that worldly existence is fraught with suffering and suggests itself as a method to charter one's way out even though buddhism both as a system of philosophy and as a religion is divided into two camps namely hinayana and mahayana both of these however are united on some of the foundational principles of buddhism the fundamental to an understanding of buddhism as a religion and philosophy is their notion of four noble truths they are there is suffering there is a cause of suffering there is a cessation of suffering there is a way unflinching awareness of these four noble truths is the first step towards salvation according to buddhism these truths give the seeker of liberation a clear view of what path to follow in order to attain nirvana once one realizes the undeniable though not insurmountable fact of one's suffering in the world the next question naturally arises is what could be the cause of the suffering buddha clearly lays out 12 reasons which are linked and chronologically responsible for human bondage these are as follows one ignorance two formations conditioning things volitional activities three consciousness rebirth consciousness four mind and body mentality and corporality five the six senses basis five physical senses and the mind six contact between object and the senses seven feeling being pleasant and unpleasant or neutral sensations eight craving for continued contact and feeling nine clinging 10 becoming karmic force 11 birth 12 old age and death buddha takes stock of human suffering just as a physician does he looks for the diagnosis of the problem and then suggests the remedy once we are aware of the problem and its causes the next question that arises is what is meant by ignorance this marks the beginning of 12 link chain called dwadasa nidhana chakra ignorance here means considering worldly things as permanent whereas the real nature is momentary buddhist view everything in nature as being in the process of unceasing flux the human eye cannot and does not see these changes directly and takes things as they appear before us things appear before us as if they had a definite nature or essence and as if they were going to stay that way as long as they were there this prompts us to form definite judgment about objects such as this table is red that pen is blue and so on these judgments lead us to have an emotive response to these objects this unceasing chain of emotions is flux is viewed as a state of bondage by the buddhist therefore buddhism urges its followers to realize the momentary nature of objects this realization tantamounts to what buddha calls pragna pragna is the contrary of what buddhist means by ignorance and unlocks the systematic progressive causal chain referred to as 
Dvadasa Nidana Chakra for us, which keeps us in bondage. If we are aware of the momentary nature of objects, we are non-judgmental about them and subsequently no emotional response to them arise in us. This state of mind is called Samadhi or the state of equanimity. As a result, the one who has this realization remains calm and poised in response to non-permanent objects of the world. This leads Buddhism to a conclusion that looks initially a bit peculiar, namely that nirvana or liberation has a non-permanent self as a subject. Now, let us look at another important school which is Jainism. Jainism views regarding liberation does not even come close to any of the other religions of Indian origin or any of the different schools of classical Indian philosophy. It is thus different to categorize them on the basis of their epistemological and ontological beliefs along with any of the above discussed religions. Jaina believes that the soul which is the subject of liberation is omniscient. But instead of giving an epistemological account of what causes bondage of the soul, they give a highly metaphysical account of it which seems to cross even the limits of possibility if taken literally. Jainas believe that the main cause of bondage of the soul which is otherwise omniscient is karma or karmic matter to be more precise. Interestingly, Jainas believe that karma is of the nature of matter or putgala. According to them, it is sticky in nature and thus covers up and envelops the soul when it is in the state of affliction, thus preventing the light of infinite knowledge to go beyond the limits of the body and the senses. Jaina's advice for the seeker of liberation in this regard is to follow a twofold regime. Prevention of new influx of karmic matter called samvara and the other one is exhaustion of already accumulated karmic matter called nirjara. So to understand how these targets could be achieved, we need to understand the process of the influx of karmic matter according to the Jainas. This process of accumulation of karma is called as asrava. The cause of asrava is the attraction of the soul towards sense objects. Karmic matter is attracted to the soul because of the following. Soul's ignorance, lack of self-restraint, unmindfulness, passion, activity of body, mind and speech. The soul thus conceived by karmic matter in the state of bondage keeps acquiring new karma and exhausting old karma into the universe through the above mentioned actions at every moment. This results in the soul's subjection to an endless cycle of births and deaths and experience of pleasure and pain. Thus, to reverse this process of accumulation of karmic matter, one has to hit at the point of origination of the process of inflow of new karma. This process is called samvara. The process of samvara could be understood as a process of undoing or reversing the asrava. According to Jainas, it can be accompanied by constant contemplation and internalization of Ratnatraya, triple germs of Jainism, which include the right view or vision, Samyak Darshana, right knowledge, Samyak Jnana, and right conduct, Samyak Charitra, which together constitutes the path to liberation. According to Jaina metaphysics, the karmic matter sticking to the soul exhausts itself by producing itself results when it is time for it to do so. At that time, new karma attaches to the soul. Thus, what is imperative at this point is to exhaust the already accumulated karma before they start producing the results. Therefore, it is necessary to spend out the karmic matter before they mature. This is achieved, according to Jainas, by rigorous practice of austerities and penance. This results in the process of nirjara, the liberation of the soul is achieved after complete exhaustion or elimination of all karmas. The state of liberated soul is called 
ಕೇವಲ ಜ್ಞಾನ ಬೈ ದಿ ಜೈನ್ಸ್ ದ ಲಿಬರೇಟೆಡ್ ಸೋಲ್ ರಿಟರ್ನ್ಸ್ ಟು ಇಟ್ಸ್ ಒರಿಜಿನಲ್ ಸ್ಟೇಟ್ ಆಫ್ ಆಮ್ನಿಷನ್ಸ್ ಆ್ಯಂಡ್ ಬ್ಲೇಸ್ ಇಟ್ ಇಸ್ ಮೆಟಫೋನಿಕಲಿ ಡಿಸ್ಕ್ರೈಬ್ಡ್ ಬೈ ದಿ ಜೈನಾಸ್ ಆ್ಯಸ್ ಅ ಸ್ಟೇಟ್ ಆಫ್ ದಿ ಸೋಲ್ ವೆನ್ ಇಟ್ ರೀಚಸ್ ದಿ ಟಾಪ್ ಆಫ್ ಲಕಾಕಾಸ್ ಡಿಫ್ರೆಂಟ್ ಲೆವೆಲ್ಸ್ ಆಫ್ ಸ್ಕೈ ಆ್ಯಂಡ್ ರಿಮೈನ್ಸ್ ದೇರ್ ಫಾರ್ ಎವರ್ ಇನ್ ಇಟ್ಸ್ ಬ್ಲಿಸ್ಫುಲ್ ಆ್ಯಂಡ್ ಅನ್ಕಂಡೀಷನಲ್ ಎಕ್ಸಿಸ್ಟೆನ್ಸ್ ದೇರ್ ಆಫ್ಟರ್ ಇಟ್ ನೆವರ್ ರಿಟರ್ನ್ಸ್ ಟು ದಿಸ್ ವರ್ಲ್ಡ್ ಆಫ್ ಬರ್ತ್ ಲೈಫ್ ಆ್ಯಂಡ್ ಡೆತ್ ಲೆಟ್ ಇಸ್ ನೌ ಲುಕ್ ಅಟ್ ದಿ ಅನದರ್ ಇಂಪಾರ್ಟೆಂಟ್ ರಿಲಿಜಿಯನ್ ನೇಮ್ಲಿ ಸಿಕ್ಕಿಸಮ್ ಸಿಕ್ಕಿಸಮ್ ಇಸ್ ಎ ಮೋನೋಥಿಯಿಸ್ಟಿಕ್ ರಿಲಿಜಿಯನ್ ದಟ್ ಅಡ್ವೊಕೇಟ್ಸ್ ಫೇತ್ ಇನ್ ದಿ ವರ್ಡ್ಸ್ ಆಫ್ ರೆವಲೇಷನ್ ಆ್ಯಸ್ ರೆಕಾರ್ಡೆಡ್ ಬೈ ದಿ ಅರ್ಲಿ ಸಿಕ್ ಸೈನ್ಸ್ ದೀಸ್ ವರ್ಡ್ಸ್ ಆರ್ ಕಂಪೈಲ್ಡ್ ಇನ್ ದೇರ್ ಹೋಲಿ ಬುಕ್ ನೇಮ್ಡ್ ಆ್ಯಸ್ ದಿ ಗುರು ಗ್ರಂಥ ಸಾಹಿಬ್ ದೇರ್ ಹೋಲಿ ಬುಕ್ ಇಸ್ ಟ್ರೀಟೆಡ್ ಬೈ ದಮ್ ಆ್ಯಸ್ ಎ ಲೈವ್ ಟೀಚರ್ ಆರ್ ಗುರು ಆ್ಯಂಡ್ ರಿವೇರ್ಡ್ ಲೈಕ್ ಎ ಲಿವಿಂಗ್ ಸೈಂಟ್ ಸಿಕ್ ಗುರುಸ್ ಆರ್ ರೆಕಾರ್ಡೆಡ್ ಇನ್ ದೇರ್ ಹೋಲಿ ಬುಕ್ ಅಡ್ವೊಕೇಟ್ ಫೇತ್ ಇನ್ ಎ ಶೇಪ್ಲೆಸ್ ಟೈಮ್ಲೆಸ್ ಆ್ಯಂಡ್ ಸೈಟ್ಲೆಸ್ ಟ್ರೂತ್ ಆರ್ ಗಾಡ್ ನಿರಂಕಾರ ಅಕಾಲ್ ಆ್ಯಂಡ್ ಅಲಕ್ ಟರ್ಮ್ ಆ್ಯಸ್ ವಾಹಿ ಗುರು ದಿಸ್ ಟ್ರೂತ್ ಇಸ್ ಕನ್ಸಿಡರ್ಡ್ ಆ್ಯಸ್ ದ ಓನ್ಲಿ ಒನ್ ಆ್ಯಂಡ್ ಸೆಕೆಂಡ್ ಟು ನನ್ ಆ್ಯಂಡ್ ಐ ಸಜೆಸ್ಟೆಡ್ ಬೈ ದ ಟರ್ಮ್ ಇಕ್ ಓಂಕಾರ್ ಸಿಕ್ಸ್ ಹವ್ ಎವರ್ ಬಿಲೀವ್ ದಟ್ ದೇರ್ ಇಸ್ ಅ ವಿಲ್ ಆರ್ ಆರ್ಡರ್ ದಟ್ ಆಪರೇಟ್ಸ್ ಬಿಹೈಂಡ್ ದಿಸ್ ವರ್ಲ್ಡ್ ವೆರಿ ಲಿ ಟರ್ಮ್ ಆ್ಯಸ್ ಹುಕುಮ್ ಆ್ಯಂಡ್ ರಿಯಲೈಸೇಷನ್ ಆಫ್ ಆ್ಯಂಡ್ ಸಬ್ಮಿಷನ್ ಟು ದಿಸ್ ವಿಲ್ ಇಸ್ ದ ಫೈನಲ್ ಗೋಲ್ ಆಫ್ ಲೈಫ್ ಒನ್ ಆಫ್ ದ ಯುನೀಕ್ ಫೀಚರ್ಸ್ ಆಫ್ ಸಿಕ್ಕಿಸಮ್ ಆ್ಯಸ್ ರಿಲಿಜನ್ ಇಸ್ ದ್ಯಾಟ್ ಇಟ್ ಡಸ್ ನಾಟ್ ಬಿಲೀವ್ ಇನ್ ದ ಲಿವಿಂಗ್ ಆ್ಯಸ್ ಅಸೆಟಿಕ್ ಲೈಫ್ ಆರ್ ದ ಲೈಫ್ ಆಫ್ ರಿಕ್ಲೂಸ್ ಇನ್ ದ ಫಾರೆಸ್ಟ್ ನಾಟ್ ಡಸ್ ಇಟ್ ಅಡ್ವೊಕೇಟ್ ಎನಿ ಬಿಲೀಫ್ ಇನ್ ಆಫ್ಟರ್ ಲೈಫ್ ರಿವಾರ್ಡ್ಸ್ ಫಾರ್ ಒನ್ಸ್ ಕಂಡಕ್ಟ್ ಇನ್ ದಿಸ್ ವರ್ಲ್ಡ್ ಸಿಕ್ಕಿಸಮ್ ಹೋಲ್ಡ್ಸ್ ದ ಪ್ರೆಸೆಂಟ್ ವರ್ಲ್ಡ್ ಇನ್ ವಿಚ್ ವಿ ಲಿವ್ ಆ್ಯಸ್ ಆಲ್ ದಟ್ ದೇರ್ ಈಸ್ ಟು ಲೈಫ್ ಇಟ್ ಅಡ್ವೊಕೇಟ್ಸ್ ಲಿವಿಂಗ್ ವಿತ್ ಪರ್ಫೆಕ್ಷನ್ ಇನ್ ದಿಸ್ ವರ್ಲ್ಡ್ ಇಟ್ ಸೆಲ್ಫ್ ಇನ್ ದಟ್ ಸೆನ್ಸ್ ಇಟ್ ಇಸ್ ಒನ್ ಆಫ್ ದೋಸ್ ರಿಲಿಜನ್ಸ್ ದಟ್ ಬಿಲೀವ್ಸ್ ಇನ್ ದಿ ಪಾಸಿಬಿಲಿಟಿ ಆಫ್ ಜೀವನ್ ಮುಕ್ತಿ ಆರ್ ಸಾಲ್ವೇಷನ್ ಆಫ್ ದಿಸ್ ಲೈಫ್ ಇನ್ ದಿಸ್ ವರ್ಲ್ಡ್ ಸಿಕ್ಕಿಸಮ್ ಪ್ರೊಜೆಕ್ಟ್ಸ್ ದಿ ಪೆನಲ್ಟಿಮೇಟ್ ರಿಯಾಲಿಟಿ ಆಸ್ ಟೈಮ್ಲೆಸ್ ಆರ್ ಅ ಕಾಲ್ ಇಟ್ ಅಡ್ವೊಕೇಟ್ ಸ್ಪಿರಿಚುವಲ್ ಯೂನಿಯನ್ ವಿತ್ ದಿ ಅ ಕಾಲ್ ವಿಚ್ ರಿಸಲ್ಟ್ಸ್ ಇನ್ ದ ಲೆಬರೇಷನ್ ಆಫ್ ಎ ಡೆವೋಟಿ ಇನ್ ದ ಕರೆಂಟ್ ಲೈಫ್ ಇಟ್ ಸೆಲ್ಫ್ ಗುರು ಗೋವಿಂದ ಸಿಂಗ್ ಒನ್ ಆಫ್ ದಿ ಟೆನ್ ಸಿಕ್ ಗುರುಸ್ ಸ್ಟೇಟ್ಸ್ ದಟ್ ಹ್ಯೂಮನ್ ಬರ್ತ್ ಇಸ್ ಅ ಗೇಟ್ ಗ್ರೂ ಇನ್ ಇಟ್ ಸೆಲ್ಫ್ ಬಿಕಾಸ್ ಸಾಲ್ವೇಷನ್ ಇಸ್ ಪಾಸಿಬಲ್ ಓನ್ಲಿ ಇನ್ ಹ್ಯೂಮನ್ ಬರ್ತ್ ದೇರ್ ಫಾರ್ ಒನ್ ಶುಡ್ ಮೇಕ್ ದ ಬೆಸ್ಟ್ ಸ್ಪಿರಿಚುವಲ್ ಪಾಸಿಬಿಲಿಟೀಸ್ ಆಫರ್ಡ್ ಇನ್ ದಿಸ್ ಬರ್ತ್ there is a difference of opinion among scholars on sikhism about the role of karma and reincarnation in sikh philosophy it is generally held that according to sikhism the body takes birth because of karma but salvation is attained through grace there is an emphasis upon singing and music as leading one to a more purified state of mind in sikhism and these are referred to as shabad or and kirtan remembering the grace of god referring to as simran or remembrance is also considered as one of the virtues that could help one in getting the grace of god apart from this service and action for the sake of community and religion are also held as some of the highly esteemed virtues according to sikhism in its social aspect sikh gurus put a premium on equality of all humans as a value and urge their followers to reject discrimination on the basis of caste or gender so to summarize the this module let us look at the broad convergence amongst all religions is the salvation but there is a wide variety despite this convergence about what is